So I'll go ahead and start. I'm Justin Carmody. Um, I work at a company called Desert Digital Media. We're based out of uh, downtown Salt Lake. We do PSL.com, DesertDigital.com, Family Share, a bunch of others. Terrible, terrible world. Word. Word. You know, it's like 
you have choice A or choice B, which is slot. Like, mm -hmm. who, who do you want to be? He's like, well, of course, I want to be this. So typically when people first hear agile, like, oh, it's this cool little thing, waterfalls are terrible somehow, and we're going to be all this awesome agile, we're not going to be some, some slot. And so if you're to actually pull the entire industry um, and ask, about 50% of the industry would say, hey, who's using agile? About 50% of the people would ask me, oh, we're, we're agile. We use agile, that's what we do, that's our thing. However, if you ask others, what does that actually mean? You would probably get a huge, wide variety of answers. <laughs> um, and the first time I heard agile, someone's like, oh, well, it's really cool. You have this in like a backlog, and you have this meeting, and there's always circles involved, and you have a bigger circle for two weeks, and these little daily circles. <laughs> These little arrows and like there's different people. And then of course marketing got a hold of it and it looked a little nicer and it said, here's your vision, your product backlog, and your script backlog. And then you have your sprints and these little daily scrums. And then you just it looks all really pretty and beautiful. The problem is agile is not this. It's not a set of meetings, it's not a set of tools, um, it's not any of that. So a quick story for us is that at DDM, when I joined, we were doing Agile. And, and we had the meetings, and we had some new stuff, and, and, and we were doing very good, so we said, oh, well, we're going to double down on the efforts. And so we, we came out and we made a, we made a diagram, and again, very similar to DDM colors. Um, but what we really had done is we took what we used to have, we used to have a project manager and our work queue or list. We had developers, we had tickets. We had guessing hours, and we had a team meeting every two weeks. And we just renamed everything. We say, we're no longer a project manager. We're a product owner and scrum master. We no longer have a workers. We have a backlog. We're no longer developers. We're the scrum team. We don't work with tickets. We have stories. We no longer guess. This is called estimating. Even though we're doing the exact same thing, <laughs> we move things to points and we spend planning. And to be honest, it's like we said, hey, this is our old process. We want to upgrade it to a new, awesome process. It was awesome Ferrari. But the problem is, we just kind of relabeled everything. We got something more like this. You know, so we a car with a couple of stickers and paint on it. And it was the exact same problems we had before. Nothing changed, and it was frustrating. And so we sat down and we said, OK, why are we doing this? What are, what's our, like, if you want to become agile, let's just not call things you know, what a scrum master said we should call them, we let's actually um, dig down and figure out why are we doing that job. And so um, we came up with all these things like, oh, we do to do job because it makes our team more efficient and it should make a better product and we'll release on schedule. And my argument is that none of these other reasons like why you do that job. I think these can be the byproducts of a good process, but inherently, this isn't why you do agile. So, my theory, my hypothesis, why I think we should do is agile is fundamentally about making better decisions. So, agile is not just this process, but it's the idea of I want to make you know better decisions, um, you know with how I use my time, how our team uses our time, what we decide to do or not do. And we use Agile as a kind of a framework to wrap that up around that. So, I, so who here would say that we use Agile or some form of Agile at work? Really? Oh. Try. Okay. Well, okay, so this is what we call our Agile <laughs> test. So ever since we implemented Agile, we're moving to sprints, whatever, have you changed the way that you make decisions? And when we look, at, when we look back at what we had done, we didn't change. We were fighting the same fires over and over again. Um, and, and so a couple of these possible decisions that you can make are things like, what are we going to work on today? What features and bugs and priorities do we have? What are we going to release? What, when are we going to set deadlines? How are we going to plan for what we're going to do in the future? Um, and so we, as a team, we had to fundamentally relearn Agile. And we adopted a principle we kind of coined that's called 
RIVO, so reality in and decisions out. And so the agile process for us involves just kind of these two pieces. And so the first thing I want to talk about is reality. And I think as an industry, we're terrible at being realistic. Like we are so poor at it. Um, so probably everyone in this room uh, has had some sort of similar ideas. We have a project. We say, this should take about 10 weeks. To <laughs> so we're starting week one. And here right, we have our progress. We have how long we've gone. And we start that first week. And then after we get done with that first week, we say, hey, look at all the stuff we got done. But this is stuff we thought we would get done, but we didn't get to it. All right, so two weeks. Um, so we're starting the third week. We're okay. Well, and I swear, nine hours at a time before, what we'd always say is, like, well, we'll just work harder somehow. We'll pull these magical, mythical you know, coding abilities out of the thin air and somehow do more than we did in the last two weeks. So you go in a couple more weeks, and we're like, well, basically the progress was even more now we're falling behind. And so what do we do? We'll just work harder hours. We'll just, we'll just somehow, you know, we defer basically the, the tough decisions and say, we'll somehow just make this up, work late, whatever. And then we're at week 10, we've used up all this time, and we have all this stuff that we didn't get done. And honestly, this is insanity. This is crazy. We're, we're sticking our heads in the sand and doing things like that. Um, and so, it's insanity. And so the goal for us as a, as a team, when we use Agile, or just as a team in general, we don't use Agile, is to go in and have an honest assessment of reality. Say, what's, what's realistic? What is honestly going to happen? What, where are we honestly at? I don't want not bring a report up or whatever. Like, where are we seriously at? Um, and then kind of split that into two groups. You have things that you can, can, that you can control and things you can't control. Things you can't control, pass. There's no time machine yet. There's no way to go back and do that. Uh, Sick so personally, work emergency. If the site catches on fire and goes down, you're not going to say, well, we had to schedule time in the sprint to, to do that. So we're going to look at you down for two weeks and we'll plan some time. No, you're going to stop what you're doing to fix the site. How long things will take? You know, I can't magically say, you know, uh, just because we're on a tighter deadline, but my ability to do something is going to magically cut in half. I know it should take four hours, but I'll do it too. You know, I, I mean, I wish that way, I wish that worked with my yard work. I wish I could say, oh, man, I wish this lawn would just, I could just wish it, I could cut it in 30 minutes instead of, you know, and there's all sorts of things that fall in this category. Then you have things that you can't control. So what am I going to do right now? What am I going to do today? What am I going to do tomorrow? What am I actually going to code? What, um, what am I actually going to fix? And scope. There might be features and say, you know what? You know, this feature is going to take, you know, three or four days. But the most important part is this part. And I can, I can do that in four or five hours. I'm not going to do the rest of this. I'm just going to do this really important stuff. Um, and those are things that you can control. And then you have all this stuff that's in the middle that you sometimes can or cannot control. <laughs> and there has to be a little bit of give and take. So for us, um, <laughs> a good one is that deadlines and features. Uh, sometimes the deadlines are super hard, you cannot miss them. If you have a Super Bowl ad running about an awesome product, they're not going to post on the Super Bowl. You're not going to call and say, hey, can you guys wait another four or five weeks? No, that ad's going to run, and that's a, that's a hard yeah. deadline. And so we have to be able to say, you know what? I'm going to have to be more agile and be, be more willing to work, give and take with what features I have, and maybe the scope of those features and what bugs you fix or not. Um, or it might be vice versa and say, you know what? I have an e-commerce site. I'm going to launch it. It's awesome. It's great. But you can't launch it without a shopping cart. Like, the, the ability to check out and pay money and so until that feature's done, it doesn't matter how soon you can ship the site. If you can't give you money and start paying you, you can't release. And so you can't really assess kind of where you're at. For us, uh, we've, I've had kind of a mix of both. I've had times where we had a site where we were promoting and launching some new features that we were doing a, um, a piece, a, a co-writing piece with the Atlantic, and there was a set date. 
no stones. Like, this is one this is going to turn into this piece. And so we were very flexible on what features. We were very acute, saying the most important features have to make it in because we can't get everything in guaranteed. So we want to make sure the important stuff gets in there. And if we have extra time, we'll do some other things. Um, and I've had the first, you know, where I said, no, there's certain features that has to be there. And so we had to tell people, look, if you can't run without these features, then our, our timelines, you can't, you know, six months in advance, and you, I can guarantee you, June 1st, we'll have all of this done. Are any questions on this? Any, uh, you guys are going to look great, or I feel like the talk's kind of fast enough. Good stuff. Okay. And so, what the decisions you want to do is you want to make decisions that manage your risk. So if you were to take, let's say you have a project and split it up into tasks, stories, whatever you want to call them, and say these are all the things that we need to build to ship this feature. I would say what you want to do is you want to plot them on a graph, mentally or physically, however you want, about how critical a piece of is to the infrastructure. So check out, that would be over here. A Austin recommendations engine that would analyze, you know, your browser history or somehow, or your browsing site with the site history. So it can maybe improve five percent on the recommendations. That goes over here. Uh, you know, that's, that, that, you know, I can launch it off that. And then the other thing is complexity. Is like how hard it would be to, to do. And so I would say, you know, check out for e-commerce sites. You know, it's kind of complicated. It's probably some of them that's up over here. Um, you know, the, the ability to, let's see, you know, to log in with Facebook, you know, that's, that's kind of simple straightforward. Let's say your e-commerce thing already does that for you. And say that's the only way people can log in. I think the best idea, but that's, that's what we want. Well, that, is very complex, but still really critical. And so, you kind of want to plot these things out, and you want to tackle them at a different time. We want to start with the most critical and most complex things because if if you realize that you need to change or things are taking too long, you know, you want to know that week one, week two, and you don't want to wait until you have a week left for it to launch and say, I didn't realize that this is way more complex than we thought. Uh, you know, we knew it would be complex, but we didn't know how complex it would be. And so you don't want to be you know behind the gun, so to speak, with those things. The next thing we want to work on are the things that are critical, maybe not as complex. And then, if you want to do the things that are less critical, less complex, and then these guys are your last tenants. You know, things that are really complex that might not have the automatic right And this seems really simple, straightforward, but when I went to build my first e-commerce <laughs> site, I built it logically as a person who uses so I built the home page and the section pages and the description page and then I built all these features as I can use them to use it. Well, the last thing a person does is they check out. So the last thing I built was the checkout, even though that's the most important thing. And so what I could have done is spent less time on maybe some of these cool navigation things or cool things like the details page of, a, of an item and say, no, I want to build a checkout. Like, I'm going to like, have the ability to say, here's a list of things on the home page. Click into one, click buy, check out. And then go and augment from there. Um, and so it can be hard as engineers for us to say, you know, I, you know, sometimes we'll logically think, well, this is kind of how the flow of the application goes, so I'm going to go in and start building it that way. Instead of saying, no, what are the most important things? Because I can't do all 10 things. I want to be able to do five things that I know can work together and I can ship instead of like the first five things that I can't launch because you know, I can't take people's money. Um, so that is kind of, you know, the, the framework behind Agile. And, and you don't have to say you're, you're Scrum, you Scrum, or you use uh, Kaban, or some of the other things. I think these principles apply pretty much ubiquitously to any type of software development <coughs> project. And so that was the first the fundamental thing that we addressed in the EM, was that concept of like, why are we doing Agile? We're, we're trying to make better decisions, not we're just going to rename all of our meetings. The second part was kind of improving the parts of our process. And we realized, you know, I've had people say, oh, I don't need, we don't have a process, we don't need it. You know, we just come into the office and, we, you know, we're tight, we know what we need to do. I want to say, oh, that's great. But 
I think everyone has a process. You know, how you do your work is a process, and so there's, I think there's always opportunities and chances to improve that. And so for us, the first one that we kind of tackled was a big deal for us, the idea of these team roles. And so before, we had this person known as a project manager. And they own the process, they own the product, you know, what we're building, and they own the development process. Like, you know, so this one person is trying to keep in mind, okay, I want us to, to I want us to be able to work efficiently. I also want to be able to make the best site possible. And I also want to make sure that, you know, my development team is going in and and they're they're working efficiently and they're you know doing the right things and, and whatever. That's impossible for one person to keep straight because those are all three very competing roles. Those are, you know, so it's, you know, one person might be able to do one really well, maybe a second one okay, but there's no one that can do all three. And so we split that out into three equal people. We have our Scrum Master, and they own the process. We have a product owner, and they own the product, what we're building. So for us, it's like Desiree is. I have, you know, um, I can't, so, and then we have a dev. So for me, <laughs> on the dev week, I have a product owner, his name's Nate, and you know, he's thinking about, you know, oh, I'm gonna review the, the home page and I wanna shuffle things about and, and, and all that. We have a scrum master with his name, is <laughs> Chad. He changed a couple months ago. He's now writing his name, his name's Chad. Um, but Chad. And what's interesting is that when we have these three roles all working well together, it, it, it's amazing the things that we miss. You know, Nate and I will be sitting there, he'll be talking about all these features and stuff. I'll tell him as the devil and say, hey, this is about the amount of time those things will take. We'll negotiate on a scope. And, you know, Chad will sit in the background and he's like, okay, it's all good. This, this is all good great, but I thought you guys wanted to release this week. And we said, oh my goodness, I totally forgot. He's kind of like this, you know, quiet little person just kind of watches the process and can, and because he's not worried about the website, he's not worried about the technical implications, he's able to just kind of just watch the process. And so splitting his roles out into three individual kind of equal people was huge. It was so important for us. So we kind of had to share a common goal. We have individual responsibilities. Um, and so we, our, all, our whole common goal is we want to have an awesome website, an awesome product, um, we want to be successful as a team, but we each have an individual concern. Well, I worry about the technology, I worry about the site staying up, I worry about how long things will take, um, and the complexity of the, the development tasks. And then Nate worries about how the product I worries about, you know, the feature and the roadmap and the kind of features you want to do and the improvements you want to make. And then Chad worries about making sure that we have meetings right, our stems are held right. You know, our stakeholders are in the loop, and he just keeps an eye on the process. So that was the first really important thing for us. The next thing are about meetings. I hate meetings. I, I love them. Except these are good meetings. But, <laughs> but the business meetings, they're so painful. And sometimes they be uh, really, really painful. And so we have a mantra. We want to keep them simple and keep them short. The meeting ends or minutes early, that's awesome. You know, as long as we got everything, you're mostly done, it's great. And so, in traditional Scrum, we say for a two-week sprint, you should spend about eight hours doing the review, the retrospective, the estimation, the planning, and that's taking about eight hours. We said that's, that's ridiculous. That's way too long. And so we do all four of these um, meetings in about two and a half hours. We have, on Mondays, we have an estimation meeting where we go in and with the product owner and estimate all the things that he's hoping to do the next couple of weeks that we have an estimate already. And then it takes about an hour. And then an hour and a half, we do we review what we have done the previous sprints or the previous week with our stakeholders, so like our general manager, our vice president, our you know, our editors, our, our, our senior editors who manage their team. They all come in and see what we what we did the last week. And then we have a retrospective, which is the goal. Our stakeholders leave, and as the scrum team together, we say, hey, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, and then we plan what we're going to do for the next week. And it took us a while, we got, we've gotten really efficient. We can do plan one to two weeks worth of work in about two and a half hours. 
So, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jen. Are you saying combined is two and a half hours, or each meeting is? Combined, total. So, so we have estimations about an hour, <laughs> and then the other three is about an hour and a half. <laughs> I watched. Yeah. I have no idea how that's even possible. No, and um, the, it's, it took us a while. I probably should preface this with you know, it took us two years to get the report we're kind of at. And this is probably going to bring this up, but it was all about these tiny little incremental improvements. I mean, we went from, we used to have, it was supposed to be an hour and a half before three hours, we used to have a three hour meeting. With not only our dev team, but all of our content people, I mean everyone in Desert News, in, in one room, and we would brainstorm and talk about who knows what for three hours, and nothing would get decided, and nothing would get done, and it was ridiculous. And so um, for us, uh, these estimation meetings are probably the most critical for us to keep things the day before our, our planning meeting. We'll go in and estimate. We'll ask questions and it gives a product owner kind of a, an opportunity to go in and say, I have an idea of what things would take. So if we say, hey, this feature that he was thinking might take, you know, a day or so, well, it's going to take about four days. He can then go and plan and say, do I really want that to do this week or do I want to wait or do I want to change the scope? Um, is, is your estimation meeting the same as a growing So we don't, so, no, so we don't. Um, our product guys will typically go and groom the backlog. So what that means is that our people who are in charge of the product, we have their giant queue we call the Icebox our organization. It's all the stuff we do in their wild imagination that we want we want to go do. And every one to two weeks we'll go through and groom it and say, hey, what do you kind of want to bring up to maybe do in the next couple weeks? And what's stuff on here that we don't care about and we can get rid of? Um, it's amazing how you can, you can accumulate all sorts of stuff in there. So the developers were not involved in that. And then what they'll do is in our estimation meeting, they'll come to us and say, hey, you know, here are some very specific things you want to do. And they might ask us, you're not doing this in a week or two weeks, but can you give me a very high level estimate on how much it will take to do, you know, this XYZ big project? And we'll give them kind of an answer. Any other questions? Hope I'm not losing the amount of people here who aren't doing the agile work. Is it, is it, are, you guys, are you guys picking up things that are helpful for you know, some kind of everyday non agile, or non, I'd say non scrum Absolutely. stuff? Alright. So, retrospectives. So, when I heard about agile, I always heard about this idea of the backlog and how to put stuff in, you should take stuff out. So that way, you know, I heard about planning and estimation and all that stuff. I never heard about the retrospective until we brought in our, our dedicated Scrum Master. Um, and I would honestly say this is probably the most important part. In fact, I had a slide for that. This is the most important part of the process. And if none of you, if, even if you're on a team that doesn't do the estimation, the two sprints, whatever, that's fine. Implement this part. And I, I guarantee you, I will bet you, how much uh, I will bet you $50 if you're going to want to, that it will help improve your process. And so, retrospective for us is about if we start, um, after we review with our stakeholders, they leave the room, and it's just, it's the developers, the product people, the scrum master, and we go over three things. We ask them, what went well? What didn't go well, but in a more positive way, we say, what would we what would we like to change? And how are we going to change that? And so as we talk about taking and assessing reality and making decisions, this is how we have an honest discussion about how things went. And then uh, how are they going to change? <coughs> and what was interesting is that as we started this process, when I saw our scrum master, he was a Google Doc, he puts up on the screen. You know, and he had these things, to, these three things listed out. I literally thought, that's silly. Like, why do we have to like, you know, explicitly state these things? And like, it's obvious we would naturally do this on our own. No one wants to keep doing the same dumb stuff. It didn't go well. But it's amazing about how we actually do. And so, by actually stating these three things and, and really discussing them, 
these little things, these little inefficiencies, or things that could have gone better, started coming up. And then we documented it. So we have a document for every week to week, or every two weeks to two weeks, depending on how you do. Or if you're not doing agile, whenever you decide, just have a regular meeting with your team and discuss those three things, and then document them, and then follow up with uh, the next meeting. And so things that we things that well is we say things like, these are these are action from our I went through our document, I pulled these things from there. So I said, hey, we added these zero point stories, uh, option to pivotal, so we can put all these simple tasks that we would normally fall through the cracks. And and you know, we would we would start to be more consistent with the standards and then we would start in on time. Um, we would go and gather new feedback from, from stakeholders. We were having a problem where we were having a problem where they weren't, um, you know, like we could side swipe by their feature request out of nowhere or something wasn't didn't meet their, their expectations. And so our product people would go and, you know, elicit that a lot more directly, you know, every week. Um, and then we said, hey, you know, we had a UI that we could demonstrate, so just like a screenshot of an UI that we could interact with. We teased out way more issues and good things. Kind of figured out from stakeholders and did, you know, just a, a plain screenshot. And then you want to say what you want to change and how. And so here's once again, you know, we, from our, our retrospectives, we were disturbed several times by ad operations, emergencies that could have been avoided with early communication. And so we said we designated a point person or product manager for all requests to come to us. So if you want to come to me, if you want to come to our other devs, we always look the product manager. And then he started going the month the day before and asking them, do you have anything that we need to do? And it was amazing. You know, we started saying, oh, well, that's right, I forgot. We need to do this. Because they typically would forget to the day out and say, hey, we have this $10,000 client, you know, who's really mad and <coughs> alive in an hour, and it would disrupt us like, all the time. Whereas this way, we were able to stay ahead of them and schedule in the work that we needed to without disrupting us all the time. Uh, we had things like, you know, we had a pivotal on GitHub that takes us to our chat server, and it was really noisy, so we created two rooms. You know, these aren't, these aren't like crazy, like giant pivots. You know, it's like, hey, you know, we had a <coughs> remote builder's visit, and we, at the same time, we had a new junior dev from the team, but we didn't have enough onboarding, easy tasks for them to do. So we said, hey, whenever we add things to pivotal, the tool we use, just have an easy tap. So that way, when someone new starts, we can say, hey, there are 30 things that we can go do that are really easy and can help them learn the system better. Um, yeah, so, you know, let's get this. So, what was amazing is that individually, none of these things were earth shattering. Like, like, none of them were like these epiphanies that were like, oh my gosh, this will change the way we work. But as we started review, documenting them and reviewing them, having these honest things, over a course of about three months, we had doubled the output of our team. Um, and once again, I mean, I look back, it's nothing individually was that amazing. But over time, and coding in our process with our team, we were able to make things very, very efficient by just these small little steps. And over two years, I mean, we, you know, we do so much as a team. Um, so make sure you review your perspective. So when you sit down and say, hey, this is what we said last week. How do we do? Do we need to carry over something? Or are we, are we doing good? And sometimes we have things that we want to try <coughs> and say, we'll do X, Y, Z. And we never did, we never did for two or three or four weeks. And we would say, okay, this obviously is not working. How can we, how else can we tackle this problem? And we find a way to make something work. Uh, and so one thing that can be tough is getting people to have an honest, open discussion about these things and not have to turn to like a blame fest and you're pointing or you know whatever. And so you have safe communication environments. If you have a boss that's really hard on your team or whatever, don't have it there. If you know if you have a, a, a person who always comes back with snarky quips or whatever, you know, pull them aside before and say, hey, you know, we're really trying to, to do this, could you just maybe turn it down or um, and then focus on the future. Don't worry about the spilled milk, because it all happens. Um, and then look for these small management changes. You can't go in and say, you know what, 
if so and so VP would just leave, it would solve all our problems. Well, that might be true, but that's the problem. <laughs> I, think. I don't know how, how feasible that is. Um, and then, what I find most important is the best makes to kind of kickstart that open dialogue and feeling safe about it. Just focus on yourself before you start focusing on others. So when we started this process, I mean, I, mean, I, was, you know, I was a manager, and I was like, I do all sorts of things. I'm like, oh, this is a problem, this is a problem that I did. And I would kind of offer saying, hey, there's things that I could change that would help the process. So let's, let's document that and try that. And by doing that, I mean, everyone else on the team feel kind of open and safe to go say, hey, I feel like I can bring up anything. Everyone knows I'm not trying to throw someone in the bus. I'm not trying to, you know, one-up somebody. But it's like everyone on the team trusts each other to the say, hey, we're just trying to be better at what we do. And so my challenge is to go and try uh, retrospectives if, you, if you're not doing those with your team. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 I'll even throw the $50 wager in there. Technically, I should make money from that, but that's okay. Yes? What do you want? Thank you. 
kind of see it's shifting a little bit, but not drastically. Other times, and I look like something like this, and after three weeks, it's like not so crazy. And once again, if you're hoping to launch in three months, and three weeks in, it's looking crazy, you want to have, make the decision now to, you know what, we're tracking really off. This does not look like something's going to happen. So we need to have a discussion now and make some adjustments and changes instead of waiting until a week before launch and saying, oh, by the way, we got another like, three months before we can launch. Uh, because maybe from a business perspective that's not viable or whatever it may be. This, this is where I find the value of explanation. Is, yeah, it's fuzzy, but it's kind of a, like a little canary in the, in the coal mine or a little weather injector. You know, kind of lift your finger and put it in the air. Kind of get, it gives you an opportunity to gauge and kind of feel where the product is going. Question. Yes. Do you do sizing or do you just do estimates? Do you do what? Do you do sizing? Sizing. I'm not familiar with the term. Um, well, there's two aspects. There's sizing where you're saying relative to the different So we would do <laughs> sizing. One is, you know, some people do numbers, yeah. figures. Whatever, and then there's the estimates which you use as part of your burn down report, which is what sounded like you were talking about. Yeah. Where you say, Oh, I work on this for four hours today and I have six more hours, so you start uh, to see. So, so we do, we do the sizing, so we do, we just, so we estimate not on how many hours we think it's going to be, but kind of the more of a complexity, saying like, like this story is more complex than this. So for us, the average task it takes a couple hours is about a two in our scale, we use a Fibonacci scale. Something that's really fast is a one, something that takes even more than that is a three, but a really good project is a five. And, and, that's, we, and over time, we've kind of just, our team has developed that kind of that scale. Other teams in our company, their scale is way different than ours, and that's okay. It's, yeah. it's kind of individual for the team. So, how do you get people to understand the concept? Because we have to make people that want to talk in hours, they just don't buy the relativeness of um, and they don't, they can't catch the vision of why it actually is helpful. Yeah, we have, I mean, we even have developers who are kind of that way. And, and what we say is, you know what? The value of getting a super precise and accurate estimate requires a lot of time. And we say, you know what? The fuzziness, it's not super accurate. It's kind of the canary in the coal mine. It kind of gives us an idea. <coughs> but over time, we, we're within about 10% of our estimates. Yeah, we sit down and say, this next two weeks we're going to do this. We typically get about 10%, you know, with, uh, have a 10% margin of error in that. You know, and it's just kind of over time, we say, we don't want to spend a ton of time with the estimates because we're really fuzzy. So we kind of just embrace the fact that only bigger, we'll estimate some things wildly wrong, but, you know, over time. And, it, and it's hard, because uh, you'll have people who will still be like, you know, I want to estimate super precisely. So and, uh, did you define your number two members? Did you, did you, as a team, just agree, okay, so maybe a couple hours we're making it a two? Kind of. It's, it's kind of an unofficial thing. And so what's interesting is we were on one project and we had kind of some of the, kind of a small, medium, large, extra large yeah. kind of feeling. And, and then we moved to a different project and the time for a two on one, two on the other, was vastly different because it was a much newer project, much younger code base. And so things just took a lot longer because there's so much that we had to do. And over time, as time went on, as the code base matured, and as we you know, we were sipping on each other's toes so much, it was not as complex. And uh, you know, the, those estimates of two started taking less and less time. But it was kind of valuable for us because you know, we were able to go in and say, hey, you know, this is a two, you know, this is about a two, you know. And it's good enough to kind of communicate with our stakeholder, our, our product owner about how much time it's going to take. Well, that's, that's the advantage of not doing hours is because yeah. you have developers at different levels of skill. Yeah. And I've got a guy that is worth like four developers. Yeah. I mean, he gets so much done, you could probably assign two QA people to him. And they keep him totally busy. Okay? For him, and, and then I have a junior guy, and you can't, you can't compare. You also have teams you can't compare. So you don't want... Your executive is coming down and saying, gee, how come you guys did, you know, yeah. you know, a sprint that's worth a hundred and this one's worth twenty. It's all <laughs> relative. Yeah. And so by doing that, you actually almost shield yourself a little bit in terms of effort. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because a two for my four developer guy is not the same as a two for my junior. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah we have very similar things. One thing we do is we don't share those numbers with people above us because once again it's really hard for them not to want to compare and get super graduate. And so one thing I'll Joseph told like this releasing. Um, one of the one of the things that we were running into problems is, and kind of it's just a natural thing with product owners, people who are involved in that process. They just want to these big releases and this big marketing campaign and shut everything up for months and and it gets really, really difficult. So if we were looking at our, our complexity thing of, of complex and not complex and critical, if we were to try and do all of this, you know, and then do one release, it would probably look it, the project would feel much like that. You know, it's, it's really hard. But if we're going to go and say, you know what, we could launch with just these features. That's great. And then we work on this, and then we work on this. That 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 one release now, you're shooting, you're not shooting me. Like <laughs> it's much easier to have where I can estimate some kind of have a better feel for how long it's going to take. And so we don't have, we don't overanalyze the production. We focus on identifying complexity. Um, and it's kind of an opportunity for product owners and stakeholders to get some kind of clear event of ambiguity. So there's been times when they're like, a product owner like, I want you to do this, and it should and have an idea how long it would take, and they give it to us, and they're like, oh, you're big, it might be two. We're like, well, that's like an eight. And which for us, like, that's a huge number. I was like, whoa, that's like a good sort of work. Um, and then we're, we can go in and clarify and say, oh, well, this one portion of the task is really simple. It says other portion of the task is really hard. I know someone saw the SKCD the other day where there was a comic and said, we want you, when someone takes a picture, we want to identify if they're in a national park. And the developer thought, oh, that's like a couple hours of work, use G GPS and a map API. And then the next part of the request was, and we want that to know or whether or not there's a bird in the picture. And for that developer, it's like, oh, I need like three years in a research team. And for the, for the user person, he's like, well, I, I, I don't see the difference, you know? And so those kind of opportunities to go in and say, oh, this is, this is effective, you know, clear up the ambiguity about what certain things mean. Uh, and for us, it took a while for us to kind of get used to this estimation. It felt at first like it's kind of, it feels like we're firing from the hip, we don't know what we're doing. That was true. But over time, it's getting better and better to the point now where you know, we can estimate pretty, pretty reliably. And we can go and say, hey, I think we can get about this much work done in two weeks, and we can pretty solidly hit all those goals every two weeks. Planning, we'll cover really quickly. Um, it goes to the best in your product, when your product backlog has to be defined. That means just like when, when the tasks need to be done, it's not like redesign the home page. Says something like, hey, this is the kind of theme, the template, and the, and the look and feel, and you broke most of the tasks and see what the header should look like, and see what the footer should look like, and see what the, the intro paragraph should look like. Um, and when things are broken, these kind of semantical stories. Uh, and then, end of planning, whatever you plan, we set goals that are prioritized, and so we look at all the stuff we're, we're going to do these little pieces and say at the end of two weeks, we should have, you know, I'll, I mean, I'll use an example. So we're, we're, we're building an internal CMS that we're refactoring right now. And we'll say, I should be able to, you know, edit multiple page articles. I should be able to, uh, you know, drag and drop pictures from the media library. I should be able to do, you know, you know have it automatic post on Twitter. You know, looking at all those tasks we have, by the end of that, we should have these three goals. And then we can review that because it's amazing by the end of this, end of, end of two weeks, we can get so much done and forget about those goals and go back and say, oh, well, we did a lot of work. We actually didn't accomplish the things we wanted to set up to accomplish. And then in the meeting, make sure everyone knows what they're going to be doing next. So when you leave the meeting, you know, I know what I'm working on. I don't have anything blocking or pending or impeding me from doing that. And we're going to go. Stand up. Uh, we focus on the spirit of the meeting of the rule. We sit down in our stand ups. That's like blasphemy. 
We have a double <laughs> team in Ukraine who we 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 go over and hang out. So it's our morning, it's their evening, it's the end of the day. And we sit down at tables, you know, but we can still keep them nice and short. And we basically go around the room and identify three things. What happened the previous day? What we're gonna work on today, anything why. And it's amazing how sometimes you can forget one or two of these things. So we're, we're very, very clear. What I work on this for me is this. What I'm going to do today is this. And this is what's blocking me. And this is an opportunity to make decisions. And so, you know, you know, you might, you know, sometimes developers we can kind of forget that certain things are blocking us, or we, you know, or and we'll we'll kind of forget to bring it up or whatever. It might go a couple days. And as a manager, you might not realize that your team is blocked on certain things. So this is an opportunity to say, oh, you don't have credentials to the SaaS providers thing that we're integrating with. I'm going to stop what I'm doing and go get those credentials and unblock you. Or I'd say, you know what, I'm waiting on HR or some other organization to get, uh, get that to us. It might be two or three days. Let's have you not worry about that and work on something else. Um, so, you know, once again, three days later, you can't control what you did, what you've done before. So you want to, what you're able to do now is very, very precious. Okay. Any questions before I have my like, final thought? I know it's a lot, especially for people, for some people who have never done a high job before. Any questions? Yes. To so what extent is this, do you have to remember yourself a little bit less than the other day I go to the less than the other day? And what extent is this is generally put more? So for us, so you have Scrum, which is very rigid. So we follow Scrum, we kind of mold it, and, and some Scrum advocates say you have to, what they call Scrum butts. We say, well, we do Scrum, but we do this, 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 this different things. And for us, it's kind of, are we honoring the spirit of the role? Are, are, we, are we trying to solve that intent that Scrum is trying to solve? So it's standards. We sit down. And the reason why we say stand up is so the meetings get short. And so we say, okay, we sit down because it's we don't, we don't want, you know, the people on the other side of the, on the, on the cameras here in this section, that's not what we're using for a topic. So we sit down so we can see our faces, but we focus so we keep, we keep it on the clock and say, hey, we're trying to do this in 15 minutes or less, and sometimes it goes through this five. And then if there's a couple of days that it goes really long, we bring it up in the retrospective and say, hey, you know. And so we try really hard to follow that, and there's certain things about Scrum that we've tried, just not that effective for us. And so we say, you know what? We just don't do that. And if, if what that thing is trying to solve becomes a problem in the retrospective, we'll try and find ways to address it. Um, so that, you know, I'm a huge believer of you start by little things and put the retrospective, and then you start doing little things to see if you can help improve your process. Um, and, and that way is much more effective than having a strong person like reading the Scrum book and saying, this is the word, we are doing this, and it ends with us. Because then you have people who start going through the motion instead of really trying to figure out how can I be more agile in what we're doing and, and use our time effectively to make better decisions. Any other questions?
but it, feel, it shouldn't feel like it's just the way you do work. It shouldn't feel like it's just a report I have to fill out because it's really accomplishing anything or whatever. And that's kind of how we look at it. It's just a, it should feel how you do work. And we have seven <coughs> different scrum teams at EDM. And if you compare, there's a lot of things similar, there's also a lot of things that can be very different. The Desert Abyss team versus the KSO Abyss team, we're very different. But we both have a retrospective. Every two weeks we review what we did to do better. And you know, their way of approaching things is very different than the way we approach things. But if it works as effective, then we're good. Um, and so that's what kind of always assessing where you're at, that's where the estimation kind of those, you know, your timelines and if you generate the work you're doing becomes valuable. You can kind of get a feel for how you're doing it. And say, hey, this is something like we're doing. What do we want to change? Doesn't that also play into kind of like um, continual release cycles? Like you, you don't want to like do a monolithic yeah. change that takes two weeks and then deploy it at the end. Yeah. You want to do those kind of work pieces and do check out and yeah. deploy it on the end. Yeah. Well, because that's the big thing about managing risk. You know, and the thing is, is that you might spill a whole site with all these features. And maybe half the features the users don't really care about. Uh, I mean, I can, I can think of one project, it's been around at PDM for three years, and they just implemented search, capability to search stuff on it. And, and they spent all this time before on these different redesigns and all these different features and whatever, and the users for years have been screaming for it. So they searched the darn thing. I want to be able to type in something and enter. This is what I'm looking for, not to, not have to go through all the categories. And so it's, it's those kind of things where you can do small chunks of it, a release, and realize, hey, our user feedback says they really want this feature. We were not find it, we that for one or two years. Let's do that now so we can make the users happy, make some more money. So, any other questions? So, so hypothetically, Let's say you didn't have any coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have any managers. <laughs> you don't have employees. Your communication overhead's really low. Yes. You can do your stand up in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> what benefit is there to you? So what what I would say that you can you can take away is the concept of Keeping track of your work, and maybe even estimating might not be a huge deal at the beginning, but just kind of keeping track of your work somehow, like this is what I did, and then you'll be able to, be able to evaluate that on a regular basis, and then just look for little efficiencies here or there. Um, and for self employed people who don't make or really small teams, you don't need a ton of process. Um, you know, so find kind of the thing, the pain points from the current process, and, and just kind of. And, and, Try different things to fix that, but yes. I think it goes back to your number one takeaway. If you did your kind of weekly journal entry. Yeah, journal entry. Here's what went well. Here's what didn't go well. You know, and if that's not working and you feel like lonely well, stuff, you can maybe try sock puppets or. <laughs> <laughs> you know. We call it talking with the dog. Say rubber duck. Yes. Rubber yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and that might come out and so, say, you know, you got a rubber duck. Talk out problems with it. It helps you if, if you realize that, oh, I solved my problem by just going through the process of articulating. So, yes. All right. So, a couple final thoughts. Everyone has a process. So Steve, you have a process. You know, how you decide what you're going to work on, how you decide what you're going to do that day. There's a process behind that. It might not, it might not be super formal, and that's okay. Uh, but, Everyone has a process, so you might as well try and be strategic about it and say, hey, you know, what can I do to try and make sure I, I use my time wisely and I'm working on the right thing and I'm solving the right problems. Um, I'll be a huge spirit over the rule. Uh, we went, we renamed all of our stuff, and we followed the rules, we had all the meetings, we jumped through all the hoops, and we got squat done. So, you know, always keep it on the spirit. If following the rule, the rule should be helps you keep the spirit, that's great. Uh, but always keep the spirit over the, over the hard roll. 
We always look for ways to improve. Um, and then, uh, let's see one. And then I, 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 I thought I had a site again that says, you know, be a positive influence. And this is for the other spectrum of people who, we thought like there was an organization with all sorts of people, you know, that's out of their control and, and we can't snap their fingers and become an agile overnight. You know, or even have the, we couldn't, they couldn't even try to if you wanted to. Um, but to go in and try to make positive influence and say, hey, let's just try one small thing at a time and, and work baby step twice. Um, you can always have some words. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. You can leave off um, don't leave feedback if I answer down to talk this. It's like six months old. Are there any questions? Yep. And I'm always on the IRC channel. Yeah, that's it. Awesome.